So we're not going to box up here. No. 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 But, uh, but I, I am going to ask you some questions. Uh, and uh, we've done this before. But I, I want to start, we, when, when you and I uh, talked once before, uh, we talked a little bit about your, your life as a young person in, in Turkey. And I remember you telling me that at that point, you didn't really feel like um, CEOs, business leaders, were necessarily your favorite people, that they didn't necessarily do good in the world. Can you explain why that was? Sure, yeah. I mean, I agree with Cal. I, I think the story is, you know, is, is the one that makes us the most, you know, our life and what we want to do in life. But when I, when I, you know, every day, there's not a day that goes by that I don't go travel back to my childhood. So it comes out very, early, very easy when I, when I talk about things. It's very simple. It's um, eastern part of Turkey. Um, you know, it's, it's the weather of Colorado. Um, you know, mountains are pretty snowy mountains. And then uh, in the summer, uh, we will take our sheep and cows and goats and we'll go up into the mountains and then make some cheese and yogurt uh, during that time. And then in the winter, we will come back because there will be a lot of snow. And when you, are, when you go up in the mountains, there's nothing you can buy. There's, money means nothing. You know, you basically, even if you had millions, you couldn't do anything with it. And in town, there was only one store. So if, if you could buy something, it was like chocolates and all that kind of stuff. Um, as a child, we learned not to pay attention to money. And it was about the honor and dignity, you know, the other stuff that people pay attention to. And from, from the distance, the CEOs and the businesses, the, I, I call it rich people, they looked pretty ugly to us. Ugly. Ugly. And, and simply because they, you could sense that they're looking down on people. You could sense that the, the sufferings of the ordinary people were, were reason of those, those guys. And there's a small minority up there. And as I get conscious and more and I got to the universities and all that stuff, that idea became, you know, became a political view on me. And I started newspapers and got in trouble with the government because of it, is simply that my mother's teaching, my father's teaching, what we saw in that, in that place where there was enough for everyone to share, there was enough for everyone to be, feel safe, and yet there was this group of people that somehow they called them successful, that they would make a lot of wealth and they would have no interest on what happens to everybody else, and yet some of their wealth was being built with their act and suffering of the others. So I hated them. I never thought I would be one of them. And all my life until I came to America, I, every time they raised the question of businesses, I, was, I would, like for the memory, memory of my mother, I would never get close to it. Uh, and when I made it to upstate, and, and in this country, I saw a different part of rich. Yeah, so what changed? Did, did you change or did you see something different? Yeah, what, what I have, um, what I saw open my eyes is different than the other you know, developing countries and third world countries, even though the system here is not perfect. But I saw it in those towns in, uh, in upstate New York where the profile of the rich one wasn't that bad. It wasn't perfect, but it wasn't as bad as I saw back there. And, and I realized that when I started a cheese company, small making cheese, I realized that I had a lot of good stuff in me that I could implement in this field, which, um, you know, I could really do something with, with this and implement what, what I learned in upstate New York and in, in, in also in Turkey. So the rich profile, I'm not talking about Wall Street, but the rich profile I saw in the rural area uh, were not that bad. So probably that made me to think about... But, but Wall Street was still bad? Still is bad, yeah. <laughs> so, so sorry if anybody's here. I don't <laughs> think conscious capitalism made it there yet. You, um, there's a, there's this phrase, this phrase you used with one of our, our reporters when we did a, a story about you at Fast Company. You said, uh, "I'm a shepherd and I'm a warrior," right? Which is um, a, another kind of story ab about yourself. But because you you're you take care of your employees and your community. But you also know that you have to be like a really tough business person to be able to succeed. Right. How does that balance? I mean, you know, first of all, in my story, and I don't know if this is the same as all my colleagues here, or it might be different. I, I gotta say, when I started Chobani, I was angry. 
You were angry? I was angry. So there was this anger I had. And there was this passion I had at the same time. And I had this compassion to the people I was working with, which five of them was factory workers. And I felt like I had this responsibility to my mother to do something that she so much trusted that I would, that I would put something in the world. And I did not know why she thought that I was this amazing guy. Um, and I wanted to wonder, I wanted to find out what it was, not to prove, but because I trusted her, 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 her view. So anger, because somebody, a big company, I will tell you, Kraft, closed that factory after 75 years without even knowing who were running this factory, without even knowing who lived in that small place. They just made a decision and closed it, 55 people left and done after 75, eight years. And if, I, if they had met them, if they knew them, if they knew the community, they would understand that you don't close this, you built in here because this is the gold mine right here. These people are the, are the most um, important assets, if you call it assets, that you might wanna have. So that was an anger. One second is, I said, we're gonna show this son of a bitches what we're made of. You know, that, that was the anger part. And that brings my fighter side because we have to have this healthy anger, we have to have this passion, and we have to be successful than the other guys to prove that this model really works. So now you talk about the shepherd side, and the shepherd side is, was very easy because, you know, mountains and all that stuff. I wanted to lift up the people in there. I wanted to start something that was wrongly stopped, that this starting will last a lot longer and more effective, and it will touch people directly or emotionally by watching and seeing it, that it would lift them up. And, and I think we travel, me, myself, and the, everyone at Chobani, we travel between these two dimensions, between the being competitive, successful, you know, healthy anger and all that kind of stuff within red lines, and yet never lose sight of the shepherd side of every act that we do, not when we come back, when we make money and when we give it to somebody else, but every act that we do every single day, that there is that consciousness in there that it will affect somebody's life in a positive way. And, and you have one shot on this. I have to sell yogurt. And if I don't sell a lot of yogurt, then I will have people who have money will come and get involved with my company. And then they will make decisions for me. Then they will get more shares and they will get more shares and they will get more shares. And then I become a slave. So I have conflict between trying to be myself or receive an order from the guy who has the money. And then, you know, I know what I'm going to do at that moment. I'm either gonna blow myself, I'm, I'm gonna kill him. I, mean, I don't know how I'm gonna react because I become someone I hate. And I see my colleagues and my entrepreneur colleagues who start companies with an amazing attitude and amazing reasons. And yet, we all come to that place of bringing, I don't wanna call devil, but to bring in the person who is not in the same blood type into the company, and that's when things start going falling apart. So I was so focused on competitiveness, so focused on cost savings, so focused on making things a lot faster. With that million seven hundred thousand that we got loan, in 2007, we, la we launched Chobani in October. By 2012, we were billion in sales. I had zero, I brought zero money from outside. I did not get one penny from outside, no, no, no fundraising. And all is done with profitability. So for that reason, I stayed independent. I never answered private equity VC guys' phone calls because I didn't have to. And I, every penny I made, I built factories. That old factory became one of the largest factories in the US, and I built one of the largest factories in the world in Idaho with you know, five, six, seven hundred million dollars. The reason I'm saying is we have to be master on how to run the business to make profits so we can stay true to our, um, our, uh, our mission, our reasoning of studying all this. So I've never run company, I've never studied in university, I never had network on people who had done this. So for me it was wild, wild world or west, whatever you call it. So I had to figure out things on the way. But what I did is, I had one thing that worked for me, is I have to keep it simple so I can understand. 
If I understand, then I can make decisions. Um, one. Two, I cannot pretend that I know everything because I don't know anything. So I have to create a culture here is that it's okay not to know, but we will we'll figure the shit out. We will figure it together. And the third one is I have to make people believe that I could do this. I'm real. So they know I don't have a lot of money, one. Second, they know I had not done this before. So the, the experience is not there. And three, I don't think they know that I'm smart. I don't even know I'm smart. So there's nothing for me to, for me to convince them, especially the first five people that we are, you know, I hire the factory for people. So, but I have to make them believe. So for that, I have to believe. So I had one thing that working for me is being there. So when we decided to paint the wall, that, like you said, that summer, there was no other idea I had, those four or five people. So that summer we paint the walls and I painted with them every day. But then when we launched Shobani, when I had the sign that this was going in the right direction, I never left the factory. I never, um, not even one, you know, one weekend. I was there when they were there. So what I'm trying to say is, in order to start for me, that um, where I wanted to take, I had to go into the simplest details of every single minute and seconds and be with them. And once I knew that I got the five people, and then the 10, and the 15, and then the county, and then the community, and all that stuff, the rest was easy. I just have to stay true to, true to, true to myself uh, and, and act upon it. So uh, um, before the lights went out, you, uh, you were talking. So, so basically, yeah. while we are figuring this out, Kraft and General Mills and all the others did not matter to us anymore. You're, you're not thinking about them. We never thought about them. We, we, we just wanted to think about what we were doing every single day. The only thing that matters to me, how did they, their yogurt cup looked and how was my, looked, my yogurt like? I mean, I would taste their yogurt. And every time I eat them, I say, okay, we're good, still good now. We can, you know, we, <laughs> they're still sleeping, we can still go. You know, that kind of, that kind of, but I never pay attention to them. I still don't know how they run their companies. I still don't. Um, so sometimes not knowing is a blessing, really is. When, when you um, have to balance what you do to grow the business, what you do for your other stakeholders, for your employees, for the community, for your customers, as you get bigger, does that get harder? Well, very good question. Yes, it gets harder, but at the same time, it gets easier. Um, so what, what gets harder, what gets easier? So it gets harder because you have more people um, and you get a lot of people coming in and you have to keep the culture and the mission and the company's direction in the right direction and going in the right direction. And early on, I would be like a guerrilla tactic. You know, we don't have board meetings, we don't have committees, we don't have managers and all that kind of stuff. We do this, we do this, we do this, let's go. You know, it's like we don't have time. But that's not sustainable, so you have to put infrastructure in place. When you put the infrastructure in place, you bring a lot of people from outside. Some of them are working on those companies that, right. that, that they come in. So it gets harder to keep the culture and the mission and the reason and the transfer between, you know, behavior of transfer between shepherds and the fighters going back and forth in the right place so because there's a lot of stuff coming up. It's easier because I can sleep. I can go to the other places. I can come here and talk. And, 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 and then, then you have so many brothers and sisters that they will do things like better than you do if it's, right, it's, if it's in the right place. So it's this balance. I was more scared in 2012, 2014 uh, on the history of Chobani more than ever before because I was changing the skin and I didn't know what was going to happen. It was easier before because I was always there. And when I made this transform of change to become more, you know, structured and, and not to lose the soul at the same time, I would say one of the hardest things to do. So I, I want to change the tack a little bit here. Um, you have made it a point of hiring uh, lots of refugees at uh, Chobani. Um, and also focusing on rural communities in Idaho and in New York. And um, in the broad picture, politically, helping refugees is like a liberal issue. You know, helping rural communities is like a conservative issue. Are, are, are these political labels like meaningful 
So that makes it meaningless, isn't it? I mean, it was a great question. Um, so actually, we did that, Bob, in 2000, um, like seven years before the story came out, I think, or five years. Um, and when we hired back everybody that Kraft let go, and then hundreds more, I mean, hundreds more, and hundreds more, and then I was expanding the geography, and I lived in Utica at that time, and, and I would hear that people from different parts of the world will come and, you know, uh, settle there. The government was settling there, and they were having a hard time to find jobs. So for me, it was, um, people need job, I need workers, how, how do I solve this problem? Um, ordinary business will say, oh, there's a risk. What if they come and there's a conflict in the plant? What if they come and there's not enough training and I will have problem? What if, you know, I have pushback because of the town and this, that? what if they do something that, you know, all that kind of risk. But we see it differently. We said there are people who survived through this amazing journey that they've gone through or their most difficult journey they've gone through and they're here and they want to start their life. How do I make an opportunity for them and win for me at the same time? So we said, let's put cars and buses and let's get translators. And we have 15, 17 different languages spoken in our plants. And 30% of our, our, our plants are refugees and, and, and immigrants. Now, not one single incident has happened. I get the most loyal and dedicated, hardworking people that you can ever see. Every single one of them has been partner in the company now. Some of them has been you know, managers and other leadership roles. And you should see our family days, you know, how the locals and everyone around the world that comes together and celebrate together. And when the refugee topic became a political, I invite people to come and see, look, I said, look what's going on. You, these people are vulnerable that they have gone through all this journey and welcome to a country like this. And all we can do is let them be part of our community. And that, that's why it became political at the time. And Idaho, we did the same thing, exactly the same thing. And that led into my personal foundation, which is Tent, where I you know, bring businesses to connect together to you know, be impactful on the world refugee problem by bringing entrepreneurs and CEOs and businesses to solve it. Um, the political landscape is political landscape, but it's amazing that you know, companies like last UNGA week, we had 10 more companies joined. We have 110 amazing companies. Even though that political labeling is real, they came in into a safe place where we meet as a CEO to CEO, entrepreneur to entrepreneur brand, companies to companies, and publicly announce what we're going to do for the world refugees worldwide. Um, and, you know, it's a time for companies and CEOs that, uh, entrepreneurs that they step up, they take risk, and do the right thing. I mean, that, that. Uh, do, do, you, do you have a, a, a philosophy about like what is the, um, the obligation or role of business versus the obligation and role of government in sort of creating I, this future that you want? Look, I'm not an anti-government. I, 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 I find, I find a, an enormous amount of role that governments and states and local governments can play. I and mean, I see it in Idaho. You know, I've never been to Idaho before. 2011, I'm, I went there and people said, why would you go to Idaho? Do you know about that place? I said, no, but I heard they have a lot of farms and big land and I want to be on the West Coast. All these stereotypes that they told me about Idaho, I wouldn't listen. I wanted to go see the people. I met the governor who was a very, very conservative guy, but an amazing human being. I went to city officials of Timmy Falls and by the time I left after seven or eight hours in that town, I said, I'm going to build it in here. And people thought I was crazy. You're not coming from New York, you're coming from Turkey, man. You don't go to Idaho, that's what they said. But I would say, you know, you look at Idaho, we end up building a plant on a less than one year, one million square feet. And, um, you know, total investment right now is seven, eight hundred million dollars. In Idaho, I picked the community that I could be, I could feel home and and I knew it because the, in the human qualities, you don't make mistakes. It doesn't matter what the report so, so, so it didn't feel like a risk to go to Idaho? It would if you look at it from the different perspective. From my perspective, it did not look like a risk. Because I shook hands, I look at the people, I spoke to the farmers, I look at the contractors, I look at the government, local government and state government, I said, I'm safe here. These people are human, these people are real, and I trust their handshake. And they always 
keep their words when they shake hands. The government said, we will always gonna be faster with, than you. The farmers said, I will always get you a milk. The other, the university that said, I will work with you to train the workers. And we didn't have contract, we shook hands. And not one time we had issues. So Idaho today, what happened in Twin Falls? Twin Falls today is, in five years, no city in the country have changed this much ever. I mean, it's a total transformation. Idaho is the fastest growing economy state in the country right now. The you know, and... But I, I thought manufacturing in the US was dying. It's we're trying to say, go pick a local, go pick a rural city and town, Bob, close your eyes and push it in there. Maybe they close the factory. Maybe they, they said stories about that place that you shouldn't go. Maybe there were movies about it. You just go there and you start and watch the magic happens. In Idaho today, um, you know, that plant that we built is the fuel for our, our, our company, one of the best decisions I've ever made, and I love Idaho. And they don't agree everything that we do. They don't agree that the, lo you know, the, 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 the minimum wage should be $15 or more. They don't agree that you know, the farmers should have this kind of you know, conditions on human cares. And even though they're amazing, that somebody should come and watch and make sure that it's all these things that we care about, that they might have a different view. But because they know who we are and I know that who they are, we can have human conversations and we can get things in a better place. So the local governments and the governments is important, but they're slow and they're too big and we can be fast, we can be challenging when we stay real and the government can follow or if the government is there with us, they can open the door and help with us. But this is either collaboration or the business leadership. It's not the government is going to do things. Um, I don't see that at all. There, there are um, some business people who feel like if you take a, a risk, hiring refugees, uh, having someone like Colin Kaepernick be your uh, spokesperson, lean into environmental issues, that, that there are potential customers who will move away from your brand because there's so much polarization. Do you, do you worry about that, that if you sort of talk too much about a particular issue or Chobani gets aligned with that, that that could like hurt your brand? Yeah, it, or it happened, you know, I, I gotta be real. I worried about boycotts when, when the political landscape became really unfairly in an elevated place and stories are coming about Chobani and, and Idaho. There are other people who send me hundreds of letters and saying what an amazing guy you are and the companies and all that stuff. You don't wanna be in the news for that kind of reason. You wanna be in the news for what you make, how delicious your product is and you know where it comes from and who is behind it. But you cannot avoid it after a while. So then you have a question that you know, your lawyers are gonna give you, an, you know, give you advice, your, your PR guys are gonna give you an advice, or oh, don't do that and don't, don't respond and don't say anything. And you as an entrepreneur and CEO and say, hey, I used to hate that CEO that doesn't say anything. I used to hate that CEO that if I open my mouth and if I say I care about this or, or if the company does something that I might lose market share, I might lose the money and it might mean something that, you know, the investors and all that kind of stuff. So there's a challenge that you goes in there. So in the end, if the culture is real, if the company's mission and, and everything is real, these kind of answers becomes very easy for you. Of course, I'm going to defend the integrity of the company and mine, and when somebody says something stupid and I'm gonna go after because that's what I do if they do to, to my daughter or my son or myself. If you start, if you stay human, the answers are very easy. The second part is when you're real, and if it comes from the real reason, you really don't lose anything because even the people who don't like you, they like that you're real. And so the third thing is if the company is aligned. So every time I'm worried about is if I come, out, come out and say something or do something, is this real in the company? Everybody in the company knows that this is coming from the right reason, not for the marketing reason or we look nice to somebody, but this is really what we care and what we really uh, stand for. And that's the only thing that I care, but everything else, you know, it's been very easy for us um, on that perspective. We don't do stupid things. We don't wanna be stupid. And we don't wanna make noise every time, just like paper fires. We want to come out and do things and say things that we know that it might be impactful. On this refugee deal, it was impactful because we had practiced this for five years. Yeah. We had hundreds of people working in the company. 
I had to show it to the world and say, it's okay. It's okay. So, so I want to ask him, because we're, we're, we're almost out of time, I want to ask. So for, for, the, for the other CEOs out here, and, you know, they all have their own mission, you know, their purpose around what they're trying to do with their business that gets sort of, uh, comes up against conflict, right? And you have to make the, where and how do you find the courage to stand up to whether it's investors, whether it's, uh, you know, others, PR people about how this is what we have to go through. Where, where does that, where do you find that? It's a, sometimes it's a lonely, lonely ride. I think um, I've never paid attention to, the, I go back to the mountains where money meant nothing. And it stayed with me. And, and money meant everything also because you can do stuff with it. So relationship with money is going to determine how easy this is going to be or how passionate you're about this because you can always make more money, but you get tired of it every, every, after a while. Then if there's a bigger reason, then it's an amazing, you know, amazing tools to have and, and use it. So my relationship with money, I have never um, became attached to it. I like it as a tool. Um, so for me, for me, it's easy, but as a group, you know, my, this, 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 this topic is amazing. This, this, this conversation is amazing. That if my son grows up or somebody's son is in some towns or go to Harvard Business School, that in order to be successful in business or in entrepreneurship or, or in capitalism, you have to follow this. But if we collectively put in a new example <laughs> that, and the consumers backs it up, that we are real and it's not for the marketing reason because I see the trouble in there too. And I'm, I mean, we could talk about this for hours. Th that this model of business and, and, and entrepreneurship and, and startups that follows this type of rules and controlled by the consumers and their, their workers and, and their community. And if this model becomes the new way, I do not see any problem cannot be solved in the world with business, with capitalism with this type, because it can, because it's sustainable. I find this is the most effective, fastest, and long-term solution makers in the, in the world today is businesses, nothing else. But we have not been in a place that this model really works. There are a few pockets here and there, and there's a lot of marketing facing is out there. We don't know what's in behind it. So I am worried at the same time, I'm extremely excited in, a, in, a, in a both ways. But this collective hearts and minds and souls are getting together and learning from each other, sharing the stories and, and, and you know, supporting each other. That's why I started Chobani Incubator. I bring a lot of startups into company for, for nothing, just, just to see, tell me if I am still, you think I am, and let me show you what we've done and we can share. So this community, not only in the States, but around the world, that doing business for the right reason, but not to lose the fundamentals of the business. Innovative, competitive, you know, great marketer, great storyteller, um, all that stuff we gotta do and make money. And, and at the same time have the you know, right food in the right place. I, I, think, I think 10, 15, 20 years we look back, the world in, in a different place by just act of the ordinary business practice. Um, it's, it's my hope. Well, thank you, Hamdi. Thank you, and thanks, everybody.